Hey guys. Hey guys, hey, come on. I've been, I've been practicing um, something, which is Rudraksh. Did, did, you, did you guys hear the enunciation of that name? I've, uh, I've got it about perfected. At least in my mind, I do. It's the lack of a vowel between the K and the SH. It just, it's so tough. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll wait a couple more minutes to let everyone join. Uh, meanwhile, if you haven't already, just uh, put your name down on the uh, the meeting minutes. Uh, And with, uh, with Mr. Kalansky on, I can't help but think maybe there's an opportunity to talk about configuration wizard or, or are you taking a back seat today, Mr. Kalansky, are we? I'm happy to get involved. We just had a really positive configuration wizard meeting. So I would be happy to present our findings. Awesome. Uh, let me add that to the I don't, I don't get it. Why is um Piyush's name in bold? Is that is, that, is he special? Is that how come my name isn't in bold? It's, Uh, I guess we better get started. We have 10 people on the call. So welcome everybody. This is the machinery development meeting. Today is April 28th. And uh, if you haven't already uh, put your name down on the uh, meeting minutes. And uh, do we have Isuko on the call? Uh, so I guess we will start get started with uh, the first agenda, which is uh, air gap deployments. Uh, Isuko, do, do you want to start us off? Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, you guys, uh, how, oh, okay, share this this documents. My VPN almost broken so i can load this page so uh, this air gap document uh, is, is installation of measure on Kubernetes and the uh, docker uh, i did that and uh, write this document for the air gap uh, uh, install install inst and um, there may some change. There must. There may some challenge. Uh, is how we uh, how we send the Docker image to the. The the another way. I think we can use the Docker context. Uh, with the Golang, with Golang, uh, we can add the Docker context library to our project and uh, mm, change the Docker. And uh, load Docker load the command to load the image to the work node. Okay. Can the guys hear me? 
Um, partially. <laughs> it's been going in and out some. But Asuko, this is to, to help with uh, um, the, to help overcome the choppiness of your voice and to help give everyone um, context for the design that you're putting together. Maybe I'll, I'll speak to it a little bit as, as well. So, uh, Asuko, one of the things that you just mentioned was the, the um, is related to another design specification that Husseina um, is putting together with respect to eliminating dependency, external dependencies that Meshri CTL has. So the, the one specifically is on Docker Compose as an external binary and actually the Docker CLI as an external lib, uh, binary as well. Uh, that to your point, like related to, there's a number of different installation sort of meshery lifecycle challenges or, or discussions. Um, that particular one about taking advantage of the fact that Docker Compose was previously and continues to be written in Python and produced as an executable, that there's been a project uh, that the Docker community has led to rewrite that in Golang and then potentially, you know, so, so for projects like ours, we can potentially um, incorporate Docker Compose as a Golang library and have that a bit more of a tight knit interaction. And also at the same time, eliminate the need for that external dependency, which is nice. So kind of related to, to this, but separate. Does that make does that do you agree on that, Asuko? Uh, I guess Asuko is having problems with this VPN. Okay. Oh, okay. So he's not on that. So I'm talking talking to myself in front of a bunch of people. This is embarrassing. So cool. So then let me let me say these these things so that um, to help speed this along and and hopefully to help level set with Asuko as well. And so the genesis of this particular um, effort is well not quite what's described here. So the title of the, the design is air gapped installation of meshery on Kubernetes. Yeah, but the, we we need instructions for that. Yes, we also need instructions for air gapped installation of meshery in Docker containers running in Docker. We basically just need instructions for air-gapped deployments of meshery. If any of you aren't familiar with the term air-gapped, um, some half of you are and half of you are wanting to jump in and explain it. Um, does anyone want to explain it, by the way? You know you want to. Wow. All of you are showing exercising strength today. So, but air gap deployments are like, it, it, it is just that it's that um, you would deploy some software in an environment that doesn't have a network connection or rather doesn't have network connection to external systems. And so Asuko is still off the call. So I was just checking. And that's kind of a problem for Meshery. So, so when Meshery decides to, when the user tells Meshery to deploy a service mesh, well, one of the first things Meshery will do is reach out to the internet, grab the installation files the, um, for that specific service mesh, pull down those files, and then you know, it automates the deployment of that service mesh, its configuration, and, and so on. And um, OK, well, that's a problem because it tries to reach out to the internet. OK, well, that, that's one issue. Um, and then there's, you know, as you walk through this, there's a few different, there's a few different con considerations that need to be accounted for and for users that want to, you know, run meshery air gapped. Um, so that air gapped, by the way, you know, that, that lack of network connectivity, that can be done in, on premise and is most often done on premise, like in an environment, I should say most often, is most often done on, on premise in an environment where People have downloaded software, downloaded the bits, and then by one way or the other, USB stick or the 
what do they used to call it? The uh, the foot network or the, but anyway, one way or the next, they push over the bits so that those systems that are disconnected from all other systems can run software. Um, that can also be done in a public cloud. So you can, you know, spin up services in an environment in a public cloud and, uh, but restrict that particular, you know, segment and coordinate that particular section of your public cloud deployment to disallow any other network connectivity. So it, you know, often the air gap deployments are, cons you know, thought of in terms of being on-prem, but, but it can happen off-prem as well. So just, you know, bear that in mind as we go through. So Asuko, can you hear me now? Okay, I can. I re replaced my networker with my personal hotspot. hotspot. Oh, nice. nice. Okay, okay. and uh, we can go on. Um, I, I totally said, said that we can um, use Docker contents, load the Docker image between the Kubernetes uh, worker node. Um, but uh, first, I think uh, we need to create a repo to sell our latest release worth an image with, uh, for example, metri.tab and uh, metri linker to metri is still tabo to do this and uh, use the repo I write in the documents, uh, hash code uh, guide, and this repo, this repo uh, implement the download table from uh, to from remote uh, with Golang code. We can use this repo, I guess, and uh, find, uh, and we can add the new feature into the Meshery CTL. Yeah, Asuka, there's a number of interesting um, ideas to explore there about literate and, and and we should just as soon as we say this first thing, which is <clears throat> um, actually the, the very first step of what's what's actually just I wouldn't say critically, but what is needed here from a few different users is um, they're just looking for a set of manual instructions to go and perform these tasks to download the right software and have it in place so that they can run meshery and whatever service meshes that they want to sep you know, in a separate network that's disconnected from others. And so those instructions, the starting point is just, we just need to write down those instructions. In the process of doing that, we will identify some of our pain points, you know, like you know, what, what those potentially are. Um, Second to that, as we do that, the, the, the second consideration can be, okay, well, hey, how do we, is, can we make this more convenient for users? Is there bundling of, you know, prepackaging of some of that, those external dependencies? Can we bundle those, include them in either a tar tarball or an image or a, like, there's a lot of ways to kind of solve that problem. Um, okay, okay. But I think actually the exercise of writing down the manual instructions it has two effects. One is it immediately satisfies a couple of users. And then two, we get clarity on the description of the problem or the set of problems rather. And, and so that's not the end of the conversation, but rather if that's okay with you as our first goal, that will help flush out and um, reinforce or not some of the suggestions about what what additional code or what additional changes that we might make in the project? So, so to add, um, okay. okay, I, uh, I, I, I gather your part. So, so two, two, two things, if we, if we could, just really quickly to tie off the instructions. Uh, did, did you mean we added this? Did you mean we uh, we need to add this feature to the measure CTL and uh, with the uh, with a simple way? Um, I, 
it's an I think it's an open question. Like is is um uh in pa let's do um put a pin in that thought if you would like maybe that's the right thing to do. I I I don't know. I'm not suggesting one way or the next. If you would, Suko, can you scroll toward the bottom of the the doc? There's a comment that has a hyperlink to um, a GitHub issue. It's probably that second to last uh, comment. Uh, actually, it's just, yeah, it's not that one, but it's in the comment on the right hand side. It's just above your uh, comment, right? Yeah, that one. Okay, so this is the genesis of uh, this particular topic. This is um, a, a user, Mr. Mr. Pulberg. I forget his first name. Um, you know, nice gentleman. He works at a financial institution at a bank and they have policy that says, you know, security is of utmost important to us. And so we do like this project and we'd like to run it in, in our internal systems, but you know, we don't let those systems talk to anything else. So, so, Hey, how do, how do we do that? Can, can you tell us? And so it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. We'd look, it's a great question. We'd love to tell you there's, we need to write down those instructions for you. And so um, they have, you know, so there's there's some commonplace things that enterprises like this or users like this, organizations like this will have. Um, they'll usually, a lot of times, they'll have a local private repository, whether that's Harbor or Docker Trusted Registry, or or if it's not on prem, like it, it might be ECR in in the cloud or or some other registry in the cloud. But the point is, they've got their own non-public registry, container image registry such that they're in control of the supply chain for image for software, and in this case for container images. And they can control one, what images go in there and how they're sanctified, how they're scanned, all these things, um, the provenance of them, whatever they wanna do. And then they facilitate the, interconnecti the interconnectivity between that registry and their deployment. So if you scroll down a little bit, Asuko, there was just, um, you know, I was trying to help this gentleman kind of think through this. These are like top of mind considerations for different meshery components that we have and how we might, you know, and what instructions we may need, manual instructions we may need to document and, and deliver. And, and it's through the process of writing all that down that we might arrive at some, some of the suggestions that you have in that design spec. One of the ones that, that for my part, I consider has a lot of merit be, in part because we've already put forth effort on this. And that is um, the bundling, the potential, potentially producing alternative copies of the Meshery adapter container images. Um, so as MeshKit and the Meshery adapter library um, was, was written and kind of as work went, went through there, and so Asuko, you 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 know this. I'm not telling you something that you don't know, but it is that I don't think we've leveraged it much. But but there are the underpinnings of the ability to, and, and this was this was this functionality was actually in the adapters before MeshKit, and so I think it it has you know it it continued, but is the ability to locally um, bundle. Uh, service meshes installation files inside the container image, the adapter container image, which would be fatter and thicker uh, than the meshery container image that doesn't have the install files. So the install files being like, if you want to deploy Istio, well, you need to have a copy of Istio available to the adapter so the adapter can deploy Istio. Um, and maybe that Istio's installation files, there, there's manifests and installation files. There's also um, container images for Istio, and this these set uh, this bundle of install files varies from mesh to mesh. Um, it, it, those can be outside of the adapter on a file system that's or or an HTTP server that's readily available internal to that deployment. There's like a bunch of options here for how this can get accomplished, like what people can do today, and that's what we want to do is like write down the instructions to say. This is how the adapter behaves today. So it will, by default, look out, you know, reach out to GitHub, reach out to this place for these, you know, public facing, publicly downloadable artifacts for a given mesh. Here's what you user can do to circumvent that. You can 
go into the um, adapter config and then just tell it to use a different URL. You can do DNS redirect. You can write, you know, build your own copy of the Meshery adapter image that has locally bundled stuff. Like, like there's a bunch of ways to tell them to solve it. After we're all done doing all that, I'm hopeful that we can then come back and as a community, as a project, we, we can say, well, hey, you know, hopefully it would be something like this, like, hey, we think we could do that. that there's probably merit in taking that additional step to assist and make this a little easier on those users. Um, this, this one has the highest impact. It's the, the quickest thing to do. Let's, let's do whatever that one is. One of those things that you're pointing out is like, has to do with Meshery CTL and eradicating external dependencies that Meshery CTL has. That's a good idea. Husseina has a separate design spec on it. And, and actually it's a lesser concern. Um, Meshery CTL is a client side utility that like often you would find that the user, the administrator has downloaded Meshery CTL as a client to like their laptop per se, maybe just is just, um, and then maybe they're using that laptop to connect to that disconnected system, you know, the air gapped system. And so Meshery CTL, it might be, have the ability to kind of bridge, you know, reach out to the internet because that laptop might be able to do it. Maybe, maybe, maybe not depends on the environment, but, but some of those localized concerns, some of those concerns for Meshery CTL, not as significant as the concerns and the heartache that goes into an air gapped Meshery server and, uh, adapter deployment. So, so yeah, so as you consider like even Meshery when it deploys itself and it wants to deploy the Meshery operator onto Kubernetes or the adapters onto Kubernetes, th those containers, well, are those pre-cached? Do those need to be pre-pulled into the Kubernetes cluster nodes or should those be on a private repository? And if so, how do people configure a private repo? Is that something that you can do from Meshery CTL or how does it? And so really it's through walking through all that that we can intelligibly come to a place where we would have a good suggestion on, or my perspective is it's after having done that work that we would be able to step back and assess and say, here's a couple of things that we want to help automate. But Asuko, I didn't mean to, uh, you know, what, what, do, what, do you, what are your thoughts? What, uh, you might have some preconceived thoughts about things that we could easily automate that would already help circumvent some of the challenges immediately. Um, feel free to walk through those. Okay, I, I will write uh, those thoughts to the documents. Nice, nice, okay. Yeah. Um, did anyone else get a chance to read the, or have, does anyone else have thoughts on this topic for Asuko? It's, it's really important. There's, there's some significant users that get blocked by this. And so this is a great, this is by the way, for anyone who sometimes people come to the community and they say, I'd like to do DevOps things, which, which I don't know what that means um, since that's a cultural thing, but, but they, I think they mean like, I want to get my hands on some Kubernetes and some Docker and some, some tools this is an excellent opportunity. Like this is all about how do you get your tooling configured to have a successful air gap meshery deployment. So. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, I think uh, mm, uh, we can we can find some example. Uh, I remember renter air gap. Uh, maybe maybe I can. Uh, copy some idea from renter air gap deployment. And uh, there may two stage, I think. Uh, we first, uh, we can use the simple script, scripts to achieve this goal. Uh, and uh, some like a uh, uh, load image to the work node and uh, uh, apply deployments of memory and the memory adapter. Uh, and uh, the stage two, we can uh, implement uh, those features uh, with Golang code and uh, add uh, this feature to the Meshery CTL. Is that, uh, is that okay? It sounds great. 
to your point, um, the um, Pullberg, the the user that had requested these instructions, he had done exactly what you're saying. He had he had pointed to the Longhorn project, which is actually from a rancher, sort of a rancher stewarded project. Um, and get, he'd given a link to their air gapped instructions. And so, yeah, okay, I see you, you see it already. So. Yeah, that sounds perfect. And, and part of this, I guess, is uh, since Mr. Gefeller is with us as well, um, I'll ask on that one item of potentially taking action toward bundling service mesh installation files in an image. In, in adapter container images? Is that a far-fetched? Is that, do we know if those installation files are generally way too thick? Like, hey, are we gonna, we're gonna have to, each of those service meshes have any number of other container images anyway. So are we talking about bundling in their container images into our image? Like, I, probably not. And so, Hello. Uh, maybe switch on my camera as well for once. Mm -hmm. Yes, needing hair cut soon, I think. <laughs> uh, still Corona here. Well, uh, I don't think the, I mean, if you installation files, if you're referring to like Helm charts, complete the specific version. Um, I don't have exact figures, but I don't think that would be too big. A bit more sort of like um, the interesting challenge would be what do we do about the uh, Docker images? Um, and what are sort of like, so I think it would be really worthwhile to, to sort of like outline uh, what we, what, what do we, what do we, how do we define out this air gap environment and what are the possibilities? Like usually my, the developer PC has access to the internet and then the developer PC is allowed to copy over to uh, the network that has not access to the internet. And so that we describe this in maybe a bit more detail. And, and also a um, couple of other prerequisites or things we think should be in place like you, you should maybe have a, a Docker registry in that network that can't read the, can't reach the internet. And then how do you get the Docker images to that private registry? Should you just download it yourself? Should we have a script and then you know, push it to the private registry? Should it be bundled? And if so, how? And then how do you get the, you know, the, these installation files to actually get the pictures, to get the pictures or the images from this private registry, instead of trying to reach out to the internet without having to rewrite all the, um, um, the installation files, if they're not sort of like making it possible to do so. Like it, in a hand chart, I don't know, the ones I looked at was the console in the hand chart, you can specify the image, the images it's using, and you can specify the registry, therefore, that should be easier. I don't know how it is with other sort of meshes, but I think what would be good to have a sort of like a very explicit description, of what we mean by air gapped uh, environment in, in this document. Totally. We can assume that works and what would be. Yeah. T totally. Like, like, hey, you know, that um, we assume that the developer laptop or the engineer, the laptop has, uh, there's connectivity here. We assume that there's a private registry or like, and, um, and yeah, I, I think that it's a large enough consideration that, re and really we don't need to, and there's enough work for us to do that we don't need to be embarrassed about the litany of manual steps or whatever those are that people need to account like and they're they're accustomed to it i mean this gentleman um polberg was very forthright saying <clears throat> hey i 
that's my cross to bear. I'll do whatever the instructions say. I'm totally used to that. Um, I just need you to tell me what those instructions are. And so, and, and so it, and it, yeah, and it, undoubtedly it is, it is something like, yeah, anyway, let, let's, not sol or, um, let's not solve it, but, uh, but that's the, yeah, a diagram um, can be enlightening. And then maybe there's two scenarios, maybe we want to write up instructions for two scenarios, and, uh, you know. Uh, for the Docker image, could we use this repo? I have a demo and I send uh, the link to the chat. Uh, as you can see uh, from the readme, I uh, send the three, send three image to the repo and uh, we can configure the repo IP at the remote machines dot tst and uh, run this with Ansible. But uh, I think this is the early stage because I do not want to import Ansible script uh, to the measure CTL. Uh, and uh, I, I said before we can use maybe we can achieve the Docker load by our code, I think. Uh, import the Docker library. Oh, Mobi, the project Mobi, I guess, to achieve this goal. Yeah, make, makes sense. Yeah, providing people with um, tools that like immediately providing or suggesting or providing people with um, external tools like this one is, is good. Like there's a few different tools that help people preload images and pull, uh, automate the pulling of images and even in the dissemination of those images across clusters or what have you like there's, yeah. So, um, so I'm sensitive to the, the time. I think we characterize what it is that we need to see. Yep. Yeah, I guess, yeah, we, we have some idea to move forward. So I guess uh, we can move on to the next item. We have Bart with the uh, configuration reset, but you are up. Okay, two seconds. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Right, so for context, um, Configuration Wizard is a project that myself, VJ, and Austin has been working on for the past few months or so. Um, we've been making progress. Um, how we've been working on it is Austin's been providing us the designs in Figma, which are here. And then I've been building the UI in React and updating it in the meshery itself. Um, the reason I've built the prototype is um, the development server takes quite a while to look, to reload. So when you're trying to like update CSS and bits and pieces, it takes a while. So this just streamlines the process. Um, I have updated it. I mean, it's not completely up to date on the meshery UI itself. So I'll show you the prototype first and I'll show you how it looks in meshery. So that's the nav, that's the pop up. And then we've got Kubernetes screen first. You'll have to connect to Kubernetes in order to progress, which then takes you to the meshery operator. And then the service meshes. Um, we're not sure about the advanced settings just yet. I've added the button there as it's on the design, but we're still in discussions whether we'll need the advanced settings or not. And then we've got the external screen. Um, and then the user will be able to navigate either to the dashboard or start over if they want to or not. And let me just show you what it looks like on Meshery UI itself. So that's the pop-up. No. Oh. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh, there we go. So, oh, 
that icon is a bit large. Like I said, it's not completely up to date, so you can gauge what it will look like once we're done with it. Terrible, terrible. <laughs> There we are. So our next steps for us are um, um, connecting it all together, obviously updating design and then connecting it all so it, so it works. Um, the only question I have is, how do you get the React application to talk to Go? Um, VJ put this uh, question for me. Um, my assumption is somehow through Redux, as I've noticed through Redux files. But I mean, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if you'd be able to help us with that. Mr. Srivastava. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the exact need could be. But uh, if it did, uh, so, uh, Go server, Nishri server includes a lot of APIs. So I suppose that those toggle buttons and those kind of things, they can invoke those APIs as per the need. Uh, although I'm right now I'm not sure what all it would be, but I I let that demo, but I'm not sure in the end what would be all of the requirements. But I suppose uh, for most of them we already have it. Yes, for example, toggling the shoe operator or uh, connecting to a bit uh, deploying service switches. I'm not sure if those toggle buttons was was for deploying service switches or was for uh, connecting or disconnecting with adapters. Because I don't think that's so. so uh, in short, uh, it's like uh, we have initially server expose a lot of APIs, and uh, this, uh, this contribution is a can that. That's what it's on. Um, so, yeah, so to, for example, oh, yeah, no, Bart, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, let me let me give you. I don't know if this. Let, let me give you an example and see if this helps. If you cruise on into the second step in Meshery operator, um, and this is one of those steps that doesn't have an advanced setting. So, like the only thing for the user to do here really is flip on this. If the switch isn't on, like flip on the switch and sort of wait for uh, confirmation that. Meshery operator is good to go and they can advance to the next step. Um, so so that, that what I just said implies a couple of things. That the first thing that it implies is that when the switch moves from off to on, there's a REST API uh, invocation there. Um, and that can literally be the same invocation that occurs, Bart, if you were to navigate to the settings, the gear icon, in the upper right hand corner, there is a, I think it's the first tab. I mean, it might take a moment to compile, but but in there, there's a meshery operator, there's a Kubernetes and meshery operator section. And these are less, yeah, under the environments tab. These are more sophisticated, uh, slightly more sophisticated representations of what the configuration wizard is doing. The configuration wizard is really just an opinionated, you know, like directed walkthrough of the, these very same things. And in some respects, more simple. So, so that not only is it the same control, but it will be the same API. And right. So, so we could almost kind of go off the normal settings page and then kind of use that as a guide to uh, connect the configuration with it. Yeah, absolutely. In, in a lot of respect, while some of what I'm about to say is true today, it will be even more true in the future where um, I think it's the next measure release where well, it might have been this one, but where we're trying to expound on the concept of an environment to the extent that a user could load up one cube config and another one and another one and like and get kind of complicated with how many Kubernetes clusters they're talking to and what context and like and they can shoot their se themselves in the foot here. We'll try not to let them do that, but sometimes users just want their cake and want to eat it too, and so they have to you know. So we'll let them shoot themselves in the foot potentially. We'll let them get themselves all tangled up inside this advanced area in the config wizard. However, 
we're going to continue to say something like, well, no, look, hey, this is just to get you up and going quickly to help you help the project achieve quick time to value and to help you help like guarantee a user if you're having problems with Meshery and, and one of you in the Slack says, did you run the configuration wizard? Like, guaranteed if they step through each of those four steps, they're good to go. Like, like that's the kind of a thing that we're, so, so this configuration wizard is to guarantee that they're successful, is to not let them shoot themselves in the foot, is to be very simple and not, like some people may say the meshery, what? The meshery operator, so it was, I don't know what that is, but there's just one button to click anyway, so it doesn't really matter. I'll just click it and wait till the next button to light up and great. This is like that very simple, you're installing a piece of software and you're, you're clicking next, 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 next. And you're agreeing to conditions and terms you're not reading. You're just like next, 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 next. That's what you wanna do in the config wizard. And so, yes, very much so what you said. Absolute, you, not only should you rip off exactly the calls and other, thing, other logic that's happening here, you'll, we'll find ourselves in hot soup if you don't. Like we wanna, yeah. So. Yeah, I didn't really think about to use the settings, but like now, now you've mentioned it, it uh, makes me feel about 80% better. So <laughs> makes things much easier. The, it, yeah. uh, and most often then what would be the case for the advanced button in the configuration wizard would be that, um, and I don't know if it's quick enough for you to give an, ex like if you jump back into the third step with the advanced button. Um, the advanced buttons will, you, it'll be more or less like a one-to-one -one mapping almost from, yeah, like if, if the user were to click that, where would they go? They would go to settings and they would go to that second tab where they can type in their own, um, like here, I don't know that we should have URL or context, like first of all, context doesn't, I know this isn't aimed at, this is aimed at, at uh, VJ and uh, Austin, whom like th those, those things, th these are not configurable. These are just switches, that's it. And you can turn it on and you get confirmation and, and that's it. And if that won't turn on for you and you don't get confirmation, then you need to go to advanced settings to go figure out something else. Like th this, isn't, this isn't the place to enter in an advanced, like different URL to your uh, machines. But point for Bart being that the advanced settings, it'll always just take you into settings to, to the respective things. Uh, yes, Lee, actually, um, we spoke about these things today and we also uh, stepped through that code, you know, in uh, Visual Studio Code. And then, you know, uh, we went to that particular place where this is happening in, uh, in, uh, in Meshri right now in the code where, where, where it's doing these things. And, and so we are actually uh, planning to uh, 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 scavenge or, you know, at least um, uh, um, uh, uh, call some things where possible or, you know, uh, uh, or, or, you know, um, uh, use modified versions of that, uh, uh, of that code. Uh, if we can not reuse the same thing, you know, well, if we can yeah, totally. Both for the components, um, as well as um, if we can not write any Golang here, that would be beautiful. Like that's ideal. There will only be risk in writing any new Golang. All the logic should be accounted for elsewhere. And if it isn't, then, and we do need to write Golang, that probably needs to go into the existing endpoints. Uh, right. Um, I identified some of the places uh, the, the the whole thing is is, is not uh, is is not uh, re ready yet but uh, what what the the next step is you know there there are little things you know like like you said you know no url or context and the other thing is to how do you highlight when something is connected or not connected? I would say connected, or I would put a green button or a red button. I'm, uh, I, I mean, I, uh, 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 instead of having that URL in the context, it, um, uh, if, if the switch is, uh, 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 you know, flipped, it, it's possibly it may connect properly or it may not connect 
uh, connect properly, right? So e either you want to say that it, uh, instead of context there, you, we're going to take out the context because that's not relevant anyway. But see, the, those two green buttons are there. So if, if the control plane two is there, we, they would know that it connected, right? But if, it, if in the case of Grafana and uh, Prometheus, um, you're not going to get any output from that. So you have to have a visual thing um, uh, to, to actually um, uh, uh, to, to actually have the words there or you know, have some green button like that out there to say whether it was it, it, the operation succeeded or not, you know. Or, or, or maybe that switch there when you flip it over, if <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know, I'm just talking. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a GraphQL endpoint, or there's a set of emerging GraphQL endpoints that will um, be quite helpful in understanding the state, uh, you know, understanding whether or not the thing that switched on green is in fact green. And so, yeah, as you switch it on green and you show the confirmation details, um, which by the way, Austin, there's, and I know part of this is between the design and the implementation, but, but for now, there's only, there's really only like two things that we're trying to create that are kind of new. Um, one is the, the stepper design at the top. The other one is the card design for switching things on and off, but otherwise the rest of it, I think is about, is about the same. There is that label for context. Um, and really like, yeah, anyway, we're trying to do it more the same now than we are different. We do need an uplift of all of Meshery's UI, but we want to try to do it uniformly as we go. The thing I was going to say about the GraphQL endpoints is that those are our friend in terms of subscribing for an, a, a notification back that like went, so when Bart, when you're demoing the, you're walking through this and you're clicking, you're turning things on and clicking next. It's like, well, eventually you'll have lot, and it can be client side and that's fine. Um, but logic client side that says uh, the next button is not lit up and you actually, it's disabled. You can't click it until I've received back that um, I've either pulled the get, uh, the, the rest endpoint for a particular component and it responding back that like, oh yes, this component is alive and ready. And there are small ping commands um, uh, that are linked in the chat. The, the, there's a spreadsheet that links out. All, yeah. Ideally, we're using GraphQL instead of doing a circular gets. But uh, uh, another question is: Lee, um, Should all the service meshes should, uh, should should they try to connect all of them? Or uh, is it is it okay for some of them fail? Uh, uh, how how does that uh, does, at the end of the configuration wizard, does everything have to be perfect? No, nope. the last two steps are optional, um, so only the first two steps are required. Okay. And, and um really like there's one we should probably make and i won't do it now but there's probably make i'll probably make clear the point of probably confusion over the third step is that connecting to a meshery adapters or is that deploying a service mesh and so um we should probably follow up on on that because right now it looks like it's connecting to adapters and that's fine it's it's a we should start there it's gonna be harder for you guys to get to the point where you're deploying a mesh um, and so, but what I don't see, I don't think I've seen in the designs either, Austin, is like a good design on how it is that there's either a carousel or a grid or something to how it is that people are navigating through what would be a lot of like 10 different service mesh cards. Also, the confirmation details are, I don't know that they're consistently and statically placed in the same position. We just want uniformity across each of the steps to the extent that we can. There's an area for turning things on, turning things off, an area for inputting something, like specifically there in the Kubernetes, you can input something. Um, and then the other part is con really consistently placing these confirmation details. And that's it. like, it's very, 
um, th what we th this is um, we want to take all the all the thinking out of it for the users that are using this. We want for advanced users to look at this and like scoff at it and say, "I'm going to go use the." the advanced thing. We expect a lot of traction and people using this quite a bit. And it'll be great in demos and great. And like, really, it'll really, really help people. It really will. And we really will ask people, did you run through the configuration wizard? Okay, well, call me back after you run through the config wizard because it handles all of the other stuff for you. As you guys are going through and connecting to endpoints, eventually, Bart, you'll see that you'll get notifications back in the notification center. There'll be a little bit of that notification center itself is a whole, a whole nice project to uplift. It's separate from the config wizard, but so cool. So we have 10 minutes last, left or less than that. Um, I love hearing that you guys are you're meeting, you're advancing. Thank you for demoing the progress, which is great. I'm excited about this, uh, but we only have eight minutes left for Piyush. Um, yeah, Piyush, would you like to show a demo of the payflight command? Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yes, Piyush. Okay, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. I think it is visible. <clears throat> okay. So just to give some context, this uh, is a new command and it is to verify environment, to check the environment if it is ready to deploy machinery. Okay, this is to use before a deployment and that's how it works. Mm, yeah. Again, a friendly reminder, my PC is slow. It might take some time. Slow like molasses or slow like nectar? Yeah. Okay, so that's how it works. Uh, just to check that it doesn't work when there is, an, there is no cluster. Mm, so let me delete the cluster right now. Uh, by the way, uh, just to like before, uh, like this, I was doing it uh, like in a very simpler, simpler way. Then uh, Lee and Avendu told me to do it with client, uh, uh, client go. So I took some inspiration from Linkerd, and that's how I ended up with this new revamped code. So Docker was running, but now we cannot initialize the client. That's it. Feedback for Piyush. Uh, I, I have a question like, uh, uh, is, is the, is, uh, is Docker a necessary necessary for like uh, for this checks to pass or is it optional? It's optional. You mentioned in the issue that it should be an optional. It should be just a warning that Docker is not installed here. So let me show you the code where it was. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just logging uh, in case of Docker, but I'm throwing errors in all the other cases. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. Okay. Uh, other feedbacks for Piyush? Uh, I have feedback. Uh, uh, the run Docker has a check function. Um, if the user do not have the permission to Without the sudo run Docker, uh, at the code uh, we will we will get the Docker is not running. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we will check out uh, by running a Docker command, and if we are not able to run it, that means uh, Docker is not running. We will put this warning here, and uh, yeah, that. So for the no permission situation, uh, what should we do? Mm, there is a, a command in Docker documentation to set up uh, to give the permissions to the current user to not use like uh, to accept make make this user as an exception and then the user don't have to don't have to use sudo again and again with each docker command that's what we can tell i guess uh, oh. okay. let me let me okay. um, let me let me bridge the english divide if i could which is to say um, I, th I think uh, Asuko is being quite polite, um, and actually, what he's what he's gently highlighting is that th one of the error cases that we'll run into is that Docker is in fact running, but the mm -hmm. user that's executing this command doesn't have permission to actually use the the command Docker, and so we'll we'll give someone a false negative saying. Well, Docker isn't running, but in fact, it is. It's just that you don't have permission to access it, and so there's a great highlight, Asuko. Um, I think we can like uh, change the this warning here. Then, uh, not exactly. Yeah, yes, and no. Um, here, here, let me give you a better suggestion, and that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Piyush, this is exciting. You're doing good. This is great. It's nice to see MeshKit being incorporated as well. There's lots of lots of very nice and positive and uplifting things to say here. But also uh, mm -hmm. let, let let me beat you up, I guess, instead of not beat you down, but beat you up. Um, there are, uh, have a chat with Husseina. I think she'll probably highlight to you that there's um, one of the reasons why we need to break out the, um, is it the utils and the helper functions and things that we've got kind of ad hoc thrown into the kitchen sink, uh, the proverbial kitchen sink over there that there are checks already that more intelligibly understand whether or not something like whether or not sudo is necessary or not, or whether or not like there's actually a number of these checks that are already accounted for today. And that mm -hmm. um, this is in a good way. This is a great way of eliminating the mess of that kitchen sink because you should be able to go into that other section of the code, pull okay. it out, pull it out, centralize it here. And then check mm -hmm. becomes the center of like, because I, I think like, I don't know how every single time you run a system, a mesh CTL system command, every single time, like there's a prerequisite that gets checked, is Kubernetes mm -hmm. available or is Docker available, well, whatever, depending upon the context, the platform. And so we already have those checks in spades and, and they're being centrally reused, which is good. But that's one example of each of these that you'll, each of these are going to bite you in the rear end like because they're each going to have like well uh, um, what what were you using a bearer token to check the api uh, kubernetes api or the cert or what if it was on gcp and then you didn't have the blah 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 like oh my gosh these things are and this is actually why um i was um on the side saying maybe we should, it's good that you started with this I'm afraid we may have cracked open a bigger can of worms than, um, than is the priority for us. But um, yeah, if you would, this is a good excuse to break down those helper functions, pull them out and put them in here. And who's saying this is a great reference. Okay. It's nice and structured. This is not, I mean, this is gonna be really good. This is gonna be the yeah. other thing that people are gonna say. We're gonna say, uh, if they're in the UI, we're going to say, did you run the config wizard? And if they're not in the UI yet, we're going to say, did you run the system check? It's going to be so helpful. OK, cool. I'll connect with Husana uh, of this call. OK. Uh, I guess we are almost at time. Uh, to add to that, like, uh, uh, Piyush has uh, design spec setup for 
for the uh, system check command and uh, i think it's it's added on to the meeting minutes and we also have some other couple of other design specs that uh, needs review uh, anything else uh, uh, to discuss today uh, 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 Lee, uh about the 5.3 release anything else Anybody object to making a, a dot release, a 5.3 release? Um, oh, I think we can't do for a while uh, because, uh, because there will be a breaking change in that and yeah, for well, the dots experimental, but it's a breaking change. So if we're getting a stable one, we can just hold it. But, Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, we will hold hold until you signal. Um, yeah, good point about the experimental section. Oh, speaking of experimental things, there was a there was a security briefly since this is the measure development call. There was a, a security vulnerability that was recently re reported. Um, uh, the individual's name is is Lee Wang, um, a security um, researcher had discovered a SQL injection issue with Meshery and had taken done the diligence of writing it up very well and documenting it. And um, the maintainers um, here have been aware of it and actually uh, Utkarsh corrected it. So with under a week's time of like our first vulnerability officially being reported and then correcting that, um, the vulnerability um, doesn't affect any any user or anyone here. I mean, there's no, there's no personal information or no, there's not, none of, um, but it, but um, we ended up creating a CVE ID, which is to say like we ended up officiating the fact that there was a, an, an issue of vulnerability in an experimental API. And so it's good for us to see that process and practice. I am really encouraged that I didn't think anybody would exercise that. I thought that, that I was wasting my time and writing up what the process for reporting a security vulnerability was. Um, so I should never say that I'm tickled to see that we have a security vulnerability, but uh, I'm just tickled that like, you know, it's of interest to, to people or you know, the project in that way. So a couple of things as we all go to get off the call, um, I wanna say that we're gonna talk about a couple of things in the community meeting this week, I hope. So one is, you know, it's, we use the community meeting for a lot of things. And some of those, one of those things are gonna be talking about um, individuals that have been nominated for maintainership. There's a topic there. There's probably a topic on roadmap a bit. Like, um, and we've got roadmap. There's a publicly published one in a markdown file. Uh, we've also, for, for Meshery, right? We've also, I mean, the other projects, SMP and Get Data, they have their own roadmaps, but um, then there's a, there's a more expansive roadmap that's in a Google Doc in the community drive. And you're all welcome to comment and suggest. And um, I'm gonna see if we can expand on that, maybe present what a version of that might, might look like for everyone's feedback and comments uh, at the community call. There was one more thing I, I forget, but... Um, but yeah, just be a, oh yeah, the other thing is um, donation to the CNCF. So, so there's been, a, so we'll talk about that. Uh, there's, been, there's feedback on that, that we'll talk about that at, at the community call. Okay, uh, over time, uh, we missed a couple of items. Uh, so uh, Aditya recently put up a PR to, which will actually display the, uh, Meshery endpoints, uh, which may be different uh, specific to platform. Uh, so like, uh, yeah, that's something new. And we also have a couple of design specs that uh, if you are looking into contributing to Meshery, then this might be something to look into. Uh, so I guess we, we will wind up the call. Uh, uh, thank everybody and see you in the minute call. Thank you, Dimitri. See you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.